This is In Character. I'm your host, Gerard Robinson, Vice President for Education at the Advanced Studies in Culture Foundation. And In Character provides me an opportunity to sit with six wonderful people to have a conversation about very interesting things. In the past, we focused on a number of topics in the K-12 setting, and guess what? We're gonna do the same thing today. We're gonna to talk about equity and what it looks like. The one reason we decided to create uh, In Character is to provide an opportunity for educators, for administrators and others to come together to share with us what's taking place inside the classroom. There are millions of people who have millions of ideas about what's working and not working in education. And rarely do we give teachers, educators and others uh, and administrators an opportunity to say, here's how it works from the way that we see it. And so we started uh, in character to have this conversation. Again, I'm joined by six people tonight. Uh, each person will tell you a little bit about him or herself. And then after we do our first round robin of introductions, I will ask the first question and then we will go into our interview. Uh, because I happen to know one person from a previous life, uh, I'm gonna look over and we're gonna start with Jonas and then take it from there. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Jonas Chartok. I live in New Orleans, Louisiana. And I am now an educational equity and leadership consultant, uh, having most recently been the CEO of an organization called Leading Educators, uh, which trains leadership, uh, teachers and leadership skills and also uh, works on issues of educational equity uh, throughout school systems now in terms of professional development. Uh, it's really good to be with you all. Thank you, Jonas. Let's go to Leanne. Hi, I'm Leanne Stevens, and I am from St. Louis Park, Minnesota, which is Depending on where you stand in St. Louis Park, you could have you put your big toe in Minneapolis or you know, you could throw a football and hit Minneapolis. So that's where I am. I just um, finished a five-year uh, position as a racial equity instructional coach. And I chose uh, to move out of that position. And so my current position is as a high achievement program coordinator. And so I advocate for black, brown, and indigenous students who are taking advanced placement classes, honors, and ID. And I am the 2007 Minnesota State Teacher of the Year. Good to have you. Good to see your face again. Let's go over to Casey. Well, it's my great honor to be a part of this. My name is Casey Bethel. I am the 2017 Georgia Teacher of the Year. I uh, spent 15 years as a high school science educator. Uh, right now, I am the K-12 Science, STEM, and Advanced Placement Coordinator for a medium-sized school system right outside of Atlanta, 35 schools. Good to see you as well. You were at our CAO event last year. Yes, it's great. Let's go to Leanne. Oh, I know Leanne. I know you were there too. <laughs> Let's go to the other Leanne, since we have two on the phone. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Leanne. Um, I'm originally from Northeast Pennsylvania, um, taught for 16 years in New York City and Chicago public schools, and now I am in Iowa and teaching social justice courses in a predominantly white district. I was the 2019 Iowa Teacher of the Year finalist, and I have um, the privilege of running a consulting company called Undone Consulting, where we provide anti-racist education tools for educators and families. Now, that's a big difference in terms of where you work, so we'll come back to that. I see uh, Kelsia. Welcome. Hi, uh, Kalisa Wing um, here. I, uh, I'm a professional development specialist with the Department of Defense Education Activity, or DODEA for short. Um, I also have recently been named as a race equity, diversity, and inclusion lead for DODEA. Um, we have 162 schools uh, internationally, um, all over the world. And it's just really an exciting uh, time to be leading this work, um, especially not so much looking at it from a teaching and learning aspect, but looking at it as an employee readiness aspect, um, every employee needs to come to work and feel valued, um, feel wanted, and feel heard. And so that's really the approach that, that we're coming at it. Um, I was the 2017 DODEA Teacher of the Year, the first one of color. And um, I, I'm originally from Ohio, uh, joined the military right out of high school and have taught in Germany, um, New York, Georgia, 
and uh, and now I'm here in Northern Virginia. So great to be here. Glad to see you again. So for those who may not know the acronym, could you tell us what it is? Department of Defense Education Activity, DODIA. Thank you. And we're in Charlottesville, and we know that Virginia has one of the highest per capita uh, number of people who are veterans, including several of my friends who went to uh, one of your schools. So thanks for joining us. And last but not least, we're going to go to Kelly. Hi, thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Kelly D. Holstein. I live in St. Paul, Minnesota. I spent 12 years as a high school English teacher, and I helped to design an open and alternative high school in 2007. I'm the previous director of educational equity at Outfront Minnesota, and I am currently an adjunct education professor at Augsburg University, and I run my own intersectional equity consultant business, and I'm the 2019 Minnesota State Teacher of the Year. Glad to have you. I think this is our first time getting a chance to meet, so thank you for joining us. So we've got Minnesota, we've got Iowa, we've got New York, New Orleans. Ohio, we also have, uh, I guess, D.C., but we have international We've got New Orleans, so we've got a nice mix uh, of people who've seen what equity, what diversity, what race, what all of this looks like inside of schools and outside of schools. So here's the first question. What is equity and how do you define it? Whoever wants to go first, feel free to do so. I like that look on Leanne's face, Stevens. <laughs> Let's go to you. Uh, I'll go first. Um, so what does equity mean to me? So whenever I was asked that question in the past, like I would automatically say, oh, that it means giving each person what they need to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's more than that for me now. It's how I, I see the world. Um, it's how I see myself and others navigating space and time. Um, where what I bring to the experience is just as valid, just as important as what someone else brings. Mm -hmm. It's valuing each person's humanity. Um, you know, equity is an umbrella terminology, terminology where like so many other terms, I believe, like rain from it. And so to me, equity is identity in all forms that identity encompass. So racially, as far as, you know, gender, sexuality, economics, et cetera. And it's also such a buzzword now, too. Therefore, for me, it's like really important for me to be specific when I say equity, because it can be, I believe, very benign and mean very little in its general term. And I'm glad you started off with the, the almost the number or the quantitative side. Equity means quant this. And you're now unpacking and force and showing it's qualitative across the board, even in ways we don't often think of. Um, so thanks for, for bringing that in. Who wants to weigh in? I'll jump in next and just uh, echo some of what Leanne said. Uh, the, the reason I paused initially is because asking to define equity sometimes can feel like asking to define life, right? It's one of those things that takes hours worth of thought and it's hard to encapsulate it in words. What I'll contribute right now is to say that part of what makes it difficult is equity is both the steps we take to reach an outcome, but then it's also the outcome we hope to reach, right? The, the equity is the things that we do but it's also where we're trying to get to. And that place we're trying to get to, Leanne already articulated as a place where everybody's valued, everybody's equipped, everyone's appreciated. Everyone has what they need to be successful. Thank you. So um, I'll go next. I, I think um, as just like Leanne said, I, I used to say, you know, if I'm gonna be equitable, you know, because people confuse the equality and, and equity all the time. If I'm going to be equitable, then I would have reached out to every one of you if I'm going to bring t-shirts. If I'm trying to provide uh, equality, I'll just bring a size large, right? But if I'm really trying mm. to be equitable, I'm going to find out exactly what size everybody here needs uh, that meets their need. Does anybody have any, are they differently able? Do they need something special in their shirt? Um, how can I make sure that I'm providing uh, what people need? But then I also think about equity as service. Um, you know, Martin Luther King talks about the drum major um, instinct. And like, if you want to be great, that's wonderful. But like, you know, people who are the greatest among us are those who serve. And so when I think about, about what equity means to me, equity is, is being in the service of others, like making sure that I am living a life of service, that I am that I'm available um, to people, that I'm giving people 
uh, what they need, adaptive leadership, servant leadership. Um, and so that's really what, what equity is for me, um, making sure that, the, that the, the, there is no barriers, uh, that, that access is available to every single person. And that no matter how we all had the link to get here tonight, how we chose to join, we, some of us got on our cell phones, some are on a Mac, some are on a PC, but we all had that equitable access. And so making sure that we're providing access, equitable access to, to everyone, especially our, our students. All great points and all nice threads that Leanne helped to uh, kick us off with. Okay. Happy to jump in. Um, sure. I, uh, you know, I, I don't want to repeat anything that's been said. I, I believe a lot of what has been said already uh, make up the concept of equity. Um, I, I think of it as a level setting process, a level setting process toward justice. And so how, so what is the process of, of making that happen? I think it's really about making sure that everyone has opportunities to succeed um, and getting what, as, as Leanne said, having what they need in order to be able to succeed. Um, but in order to get there, you have to correct a lot of injustice that's already been done. Um, and so that means eliminating oppression where we see it. And then I go all the way back old school to uh, Frere, who's, who basically talked about the fact that any, he said, uh, any, any attempt to prevent human freedom is an act of violence. Well, I think a lot of the freedom in schools has been essentially eliminated, which means we are far from an equitable place. Um, and then also he, you know, he went on to talk about how any school which does not foster students' capacity for critical inquiry is guilty of violent oppression. Well, that's pretty harsh language, but I actually think it's very, very real that in our schools, we are actually outwardly oppressing by not allowing the freedom to actually uh, engage in free thought and, and ultimately accessible practice and accessible concepts to all students. And I think that that's, uh, that's going to be required if we're going to get to a more equitable sense of schooling. Thanks. And you just reminded me of something. I'm going to do a geographic comparison because you've got New Orleans and we've got some other states, so I'll come back. I'm going to jump in there too. I feel mm -hmm. like a little bit like Casey, I had this dilemma of there's so much that I wanted to say, so I kept trying to dig and dig and dig and get to this root. And I ended up, I have to confess, with my faith background, which tells me Imago Day, and we are all made in the image of God, which is another way I think to say, recognizing the full fullness of a person's humanity. To me, an equitable space is a space where people are known and where, and where we are actively knowing each other. Like Kalisa said, uh, she would ask us about what shirt we would need or prefer. And I think that that is part, a piece of recognizing the fullness of one's humanity. And like Jonas said, there are a lot of barriers that we need to bust down to get there. And in so much, so often in this equity work, I, people have said things like, oh, this is so nice that this is your passion or that this is your calling. But no, this is my responsibility to my fellow human beings. And if I'm going to equitably see each person as um, Imago Dei, image of God, fullness of humanity, then I have a responsibility to understand that person's experience, to build authentic relationship with that person so that I even know what it, equity means. Otherwise, I'm just going to think equity means like they want what I have, but that's not it at all. Hmm. So um, to me, it just gets down to that humanity, recognizing the fullness of a person's humanity. And thanks for sharing the, the faith um, aspect of it as well, because some of the research we do here at the Institute, we look at people from diverse backgrounds and faith comes up as one option, even for those working in, in uh, public schools as well. Kelly, what are your thoughts? Uh, there's a lot of wisdom in this Brady Bunch uh, square that we got, that we have. Yeah. Going, and I appreciate hearing everybody's words. Um, I think to me, educational equity means finding out what students and educators need to be successful academically, social, emotionally, everything in between and then doing everything in our power to help them get those needs met. Um, and we all know this already, that the process is complex and dynamic and ongoing. Um, you know, you don't just achieve equity and you're done. Like you gotta keep going. Um, so owning our flaws and biases and engaging in courageous conversations to challenge prejudice and discrimination, creating environments where students feel safe to share what they need and where educators feel safe to share what they need and then breaking down any systems that are creating those barriers, which I know some other folks already mentioned that um, and I believe that pedagogy and trauma-informed teaching and restorative practices 
and cultural competency are all branches on the tree of educational equity. And I believe that it is irresponsible to talk about equity without also talking about intersectionality. Good points. Because we've got geographic diversity amongst other types of diversity, it made me think about how do we define equity even across state lines? Now take, for example, before the killing of George Floyd, many people would not have had a lot of conversations about Minnesota or Minneapolis. And now we talk about race or equity or justice, even in the criminal justice field, we immediately go to Minnesota. Prior to that, you would say, oh, Minnesota, few African-Americans, progressive city, wealthy, they're doing well. We look at the test scores, they're fine. You look at New World, oh yeah, oh, uh-huh. I'm setting Leanne up for this one. She's like, mm-hmm. And I look at Jonas, who I know is doing work in New Orleans, and I've got Casey in Georgia, two deep South states, different uh, history of slavery versus a place like Minnesota, but then we have Iowa, and we've got New York. What does equity really look like in your state compared to others? And I'll start with you, Leanne, since we, we got here. What does equity look like in a place yeah. where things seem to be great? Well, things are not great. And that's, um, I think, such a huge misconception about Minnesota, um, where the majority of our teachers are white. And the students who do well in this state are white students. And um, so my belief is because white teachers can see themselves in white students. And so when they're not doing well, they believe they should be doing well. So they teach to that. But, um, and also Minnesota really is one of the worst states uh, in, in disparities, racial disparities in housing, education, employment. Um, and there was even like this huge sign in advertisement. It was like bull billboards, it was on uh, buses, and it said that Minnesota was the wor worst state um, for students of color in education. And so, so yeah, there's really a huge misconception about what's going on um, in Minnesota, for sure. Progressive, but also very racist. And then I think in my district, actually, we're the only model, from my understanding, in the nation where every single teacher has a racial equity instructional coach. Uh, okay. They have one, they want one or not. So that's, yeah, so that, so. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And we're uh, drawing what Leanne's saying 100%. Like we've got one of the worst opportunity gaps or equity gaps in the nation, I think only second to Wisconsin. And, you know, we're doing really well in Minnesota with our white, straight, cisgender kids. They're doing great. But our BIPOC and LGBTQ and okay. kids with special, you know, it's kids in special education, um, our American Indian students, we are completely failing. Uh, you know, and it's, it's exactly what Leanne's saying. It's, it's, we've got, we have a lot of work to do. And equity opens up at least a possibility to talk about different demographics that we often overlook, uh, either because of skin color, and we say black, but there are other dynamics of their lives that they may find themselves treated inequitably that have little to do with skin color. So thanks for, for bringing that up. Gerard. You know, at, least, at least two things come to mind, uh, Gerard. One, I don't know, it, in another conversation, somebody might say that this would be a benefit, but I see it right now as a challenge that when we try to discuss equity, there's no singular definition, right? So even though we have so many people working towards what we call equity, how do we know we're all marching towards the same goal if there's not a singular point we're trying to arrive at? So that's the first thing that comes to mind. And then the second thing, when we start discussing uh, what equity looks like from one place to another and starting to compare, like I, we just assume in Georgia that a place like Minnesota is doing better than we are, right? Or a place like Iowa is doing better than we are in Georgia. And let's just say for the sake of the point I'm trying to make that if they are, let's say that they are, sometimes I start to think that instead of shooting for what's better, we need to start shooting for what's right. When do we, when do we look beyond what's just better because we need to be shooting for the, the final end goal um, to make sure that we get there. Okay. Gerard, I, I'm so in agreement. Um, a couple, couple things I would add. Um, one is, you know, the, the, the system of education, the education system 
you know, obviously does not exist in a vacuum, doesn't exist by itself, and it is so impacted by inequity elsewhere, as, as we've all discussed it, it, in, some, in some fashion here. Um, in my opinion, it's one of those that, and again, I think this unites all of the states. So I know you're asking sort of for a compare and contrast here, but I think one of the things well, that is across the board is, is, is that those systems and those disparities in those systems exist across the country. And so as an example, um, you, you think about like birth equity and, and you know, the, the first place a human being, uh, you know, encounters inequity is, is in the healthcare system right out of the gate um, when they come into this world. Um, and the next place systemically they often encounter it is in within the education system. Um, and, and I think that, you know, understanding that relationship between these sectors is a huge part of promoting educational equity is by promoting equity as a whole. But I think that that unites a lot of our states, if not all of them. Okay. So, Anybody else can feel free to weigh in. Um, having lived in, you know, so many places, South Carolina, Kentucky, Germany, Korea, um, Virginia, Georgia, Alabama, my kids attending school in Alabama, which I believe is like the fifth worst state in the nation for, uh, for education. Um, I don't see a whole lot of difference. And I, I've been an administrator in the state of New York. Um, I don't see a lot of difference in equity in all these different places. Um, I think sometimes, I'll be honest, the, I probably faced more racism or saw more interesting things in the Northeast than I did in the South. Um, and I think that's a big, and growing up in Ohio, being living, being from the Midwest, um, I remember being a soldier handing a flag to a, to a widow doing a funeral detail and being spit in my face in the state of Michigan because I was black. So, I mean, we think that geographically things are better because we're up north or we're here or we're there. I think that what, what I've seen and, and what we've learned, I think, with, with this whole uh, reckoning that that America's doing with with our race relations is that um, it doesn't matter if you live in upstate New York or you live in the in the deepest part of Louisiana um, if you're a black indigenous person of color if you're a group that is othered if you are underserved mm. um, if you're minoritized um, you're going to face uh, some injustices uh, irregardless and some more overt and others and some more cold. Um, one thing I did appreciate about living in Kentucky is I knew uh, I knew I couldn't go to a certain a certain city because there was still active plan there and they told mm -hmm. you as soon as you got there. Um, one thing that I was always nervous about in certain northern and midwestern states is that you don't really know where you don't know where the safe place is to go and so especially even educating our children you know my school system is number one in the nation for NAEP. Um, however our, our, our students of color are still about 25, 26 percentage points behind our, our white students. Um, and that's our Hispanic students as well. And so um, we have to be honest about what, why we have uh, the racial predictability that we have um, within the school systems that we know that racism is so ingrained and systematized and systematic within every fabric of what we do that um, it doesn't, it, it, you can't hide from it. It is, it is the virus. It is the virus that is, that has been, you know, impacting us for, since the birth of this nation. So Leanne, with the work that you do with white students uh, and communities, talk to us about A, what attracted you to that line of work and B, many of uh, our watchers or listeners may never have an opportunity to see a, a Leanne and what you do. So just talk to us about your work. Mm -hmm. Um, I think in response, first of all, to what Kalisa said, I think it's really important to remember that our school systems are as segregated today as they were when Brown versus Board was passed. And I think we need to teach students about all that was done by uh, state legislation as well as local communities to stop Brown versus Board from ever being implemented in states. We have to be honest about the decades of education that was lost, um, particularly for students of color. My personal experience as a, as a um, white student and a white educator and where I am today comes from all of the mistakes that I've made, truly. My brokenness, my biases, um, my internalized truth that was really just a set of my own experiences, all of those things hurt kids that I taught, um, particularly in New York City and Chicago public schools. And thankfully, um, 
I was able to see that. I was able to be told that and, and receive that because it's not an easy thing to be told. Because as, as an educator, I think particularly as a white woman, I have this internalized defense mechanism where I always just want to say, but I'm good but I'm a good person. And it wasn't until I was able to realize and say, actually, I'm not a good person. And here are all the things that are, were wrong with me that I could even begin to do some of this work. And so when I ended up in Mount Vernon, Iowa in a predominantly white student population, I looked at those students and I saw myself. I saw the hurt that they could potentially cause. I recognize that my role as an educator is so critical because I am sending students out into the world. And what kind of students am I going to send out into the world, particularly when I'm working with predominantly white populations? Well, it's going to be students with some privileges that they need to understand. They need to understand why that is, and they need to understand the systems that created it. And that's really where the work began. It began with a recognition of what I didn't know, desire to learn more, and just continuing to push on and on um, with that core knowledge that I have a responsibility to send students out into the world, recognizing once again, the fullness of humanity in every single person that they encounter. And I needed to send them into the world, understanding that that has not been the truth in this nation ever. Thank you. Here's a question for anyone uh, who wants to take it. What are we getting right in the classroom about equity and what are we getting wrong? And you can start with the wrong or the right, or you may see all right or no wrong, or we'll see. I'll take a shot. Um, mm -hmm. What we get, what we're doing right is we're talking about it a lot. And that, that, that's great. It's keeping it on everybody's radar. Um, and that's not just today, certainly this summer for sure, but prior to the summer, um, it's been talked about for a number of years now, so that's good. At least one thing that I, I think we're doing wrong is we still compartmentalize equity. It's like this is, this is the thing we do for equity here, or this is my equity lesson, or this is our school's equity program. We do it one night a week, or we do it one month of the year. That's our equity thing, where instead equity ought to be the lens through which we see everything that we do um, in, in schools. Uh, you know, when I, when I do my work as the science coordinator, I'm thinking about how do I increase equity of instruction in that area, right? We need more people of color joining science as a career. And then when I do my work as the advanced placement coordinator, I'm thinking about how do I improve uh, the performance of students who are traditionally underperforming? Or when I do my work in any other of these spheres in education, we need, we need to bring that focus to everything we do. And is your AP uh, STEM focused? Yes. Yep. Okay. Which adds another layer to what equity looks like. Okay. Got it. Anyone else? So Casey, right, we, call, we call those uh, random acts of equity, right? The, those mm. nights, mm. those multicultural days, and uh, even the Black History Month program. Anyway, those are all random acts of, of equity. So, um, you know, and um, we already, you know, talked about equality, but I, I do see still a lot of um, kind of like mistaking equality and equity, right? I hear, hear that a lot. So, um, and I think in our, our heads, we, I think the teachers that, I, that I've encountered, um, they really want to understand equity, but tend to still go towards equality. And so like, if I just treat you equally, then mm. I'm being equitable in this classroom. Okay. And for me, like an example uh, is the achievement gap. Because to me, like that's based on some notion of equality, definitely not equity. Um, cause if it were to me, if it were based on equity, then white students wouldn't be the standard. And so, um, I also believe that equity can be weaponized and I've seen that in teachers that, that I coach. And so who really don't believe it's that important, but there might be a mandate that they have to get on board. And so, okay, if I have to focus on it, then, uh, specifically like racial equity, then, uh, these students, Particularly, I see it in uh, 
my black students, that they're going to be hyper visible. And, but they're going to be hyper visible, not for their assets. They're going to be hyper visible for what I believe to be deficits. And then that ends up becoming a lot of over policing and over disciplining and um, over referrals for like behavior issues. And so, but I believe a way to, to like get this thing right, one of it is to really elevate stories and to elevate uh, hmm. stories that counter okay. the dominant narratives out there, right, about particular uh, people groups. And so, because in order for me to know your story, I need to have like a reciprocal relationship with you. And then if I have that reciprocal relationship, then I can move towards giving you like what you need um, to be successful. Thank you. And you're a living example of the stories. Thank you. Um, I'll add a couple things here. I think that the, so I live in New Orleans as was stated and you know, we have an, uh, an entire city made up of charter schools and a school choice system. Um, you know, the accessibility to those schools, when you think about what, what schools are being chosen on in the lottery process, it's, I, it's vastly disproportionate in terms of the number, the number of kids that are able to get into those schools and disproportionately those choice schools end up being, um, those chosen schools uh, end up being uh, higher performing and, and therefore sort of further exacerbating the disconnect between some of the, the lesser desired schools. Um, so there's the systemic right out of the gate here. And then there's the, when you're there, actually regardless of whether you're in one of these kind of A schools or C or D schools, um, pretty much across the board. Now it's starting to change, which is I guess a glimmer of hope here. But one of the things that's, that is that most teachers have not been trained on implicit bias. bias. Um, and, and that is just like a fundamental skill and awareness uh, function when it comes to teaching. Um, and so how do we encourage our school leaders, our system leaders to invest in that particular concept? Uh, because without it, I, I think that we're gonna continue to see a disconnect between teaching and, uh, and the students. And, and I think that that's something that I see as a huge problem and it leads to, as Leanne was getting at, issues around, in particular, uh, one of the biggest forces that keeps kids from learning is not being in the classroom. And one of those, and that's because they are, uh, you know, disproportionately along racial lines being uh, disciplined and suspended in a way that is wholly inequitable um, and, and frankly discriminatory. Um, and so, uh, so it's, which goes, I think, beyond equity, right? Um, and so that is, I think one of the biggest issues that we need to face is how do we, and there are organizations doing it. So go back to the glimmer of hope. You look at, um, you know, the, uh, there, there are some different projects out there right now that are focused on helping school systems flip the way that they do discipline. Um, and I'm sure that afterwards I can, I can send you some of the links to some of those that I've been, I've been researching because I think there's some really good ones out there. And that definitely would be a great topic to focus on uh, in our one-on-one -on -one as well. Hey, Gerard, I don't want to jump the gun because I know somebody wants to, wants to get in on that discipline part, but I want to attach to the way Jonas opened his. I, my heart broke when I heard him talk about high-performing schools and low-performing schools, and, and my heart breaks every time I hear that because you can't have high, but even when we don't say that, de facto, you can't have high-performing without low-performing, right? So that works great for the kids who end up at that school. But what happens when the kids at the low performing school wake up to the realization that they're at the low performing school, right? Then they come to school every day knowing that they're disadvantaged from the start. And I just, I just hate to see that happen. Thank you. Can I jump in there as Absolutely. well? Um, you know, I think, and I really, me and I appreciate it so much of what you said. And it just, it, it made me think that, and I've, thought about this before, but it isn't, it has to be about policy and heart change. And we can't have heart change, I really don't think, unless we really consider, and this is big, and I know this, but really consider reimagining in the entire structure of school and culturally who it's been designed for and who it's serving right now. And I think, you know, there are what what's going right now there are some teachers and some leaders and some schools doing some really great things but it's in isolation so students might have that safe space in the school that safe classroom in the school that pool 
good that one class in the school um, as Leanne was talking about but if we're not ready to change school then we're not really ready to get serious about equity I really believe that because I, I I'll be honest I've taught the classes I've helped with the heart change and I'm still seeing racism in the school that I'm in and that piece that 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 whole like wide change of heart has to has to start with being free I think as educators to reimagine schools and we can't do it in isolation I can't do it alone I have had the opportunity to partner with people of color who have been willing um, to come alongside to help build this curriculum. Um, Kalisa has been an incredible friend, um, mentor, and thought partner for me. I, if I did this alone, it would be all wrong. And I just want to say that to white educators, you don't, we don't have the tools because we don't have the experiences outside of our experience. And frankly, it's an experience in a system that was built for me. And that's not going to work. I'm not going to be able to fix that system without knowing other people without not just diversifying who I spend time with, but actually building relationships with people and understanding people and where people are coming from. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, Here's I was going to give oh, space yeah. to Kelly if she wanted to go, but I did have something to say. But Kelly, do you have something to say before I go? I can go after you. I'm good. Okay. Um, I think so just i'll be very quick you know leanne talked about the stories and i you know uh i'm gonna mess her name up chiman anda yeah she talks about the danger of a single story and i think we have to really be careful about that danger of a single story and i think that's why we still have some of the issues that we have um i'll agree with casey i think it's you know we're talking about it more but, um, and so that is a good thing. Um, I think people are feeling more comfortable to actually speak up about the times when they have been, um, when they've been disenfranchised, when they've been victimized and oppressed. Um, but one, one of the things that I'm seeing um, that's a real danger is what uh, uh, her name is, I wanna make sure I give you the right name, Joan Olson. Olson. It's an old, old article, probably from like 1997. She talks about detour <laughs> spotting for, right, for white anti-racists. And I see that so much, especially, and I, you know, I'll just be honest, especially with other, other groups that, are inter, that we have intersectionalities with. Like we can't have, uh, talk about anti-racism if we're not talking about climate change. We can't talk about LGBTQ if we're not talking about Black Lives Matter. Like all of those things intersect. But I think one of the things that I'm noticing is that people aren't understanding that race has to be at the center of it. Because if we fix, if we address race and everything else will fall into place, most of the, the rights that we fought for in history have had to come first from, from a racial standpoint. Um, you know, we had black indigenous people of color who, who went out and created Pride Month um, and, and fought for those rights as well. So, you know, when we show up to the space um, I can be so many of those other things that intersect with my race, but I, no one will know until I share that with them, right? But I don't get to be silent about what I look like. Um, I don't get to be silent about being a Black woman. Um, so we show up as ourselves first. And so if we address the race, I think as Leanne talks about, it's not only hard work, but it's hard work. And I think our schools need to really think about creating a liberation project, not, in, not an equity project, but we must liberate ourselves from everything that we want new to, to become something, something new. Um, and when we go through you know, this liberation and this, this interior and this inward capacity building to, to stay in the work, I think that's when we'll start to see the change that we need to, to have. Thank you. Kelly. Uh yeah, and I just, you know, I really want to thank uh, Leanne too uh, for, for bringing up the, the fact that we need to partner with, with all sorts of folks for, who have been historically oppressed and marginalized and, uh, and be grateful to folks that are willing to pay that cultural tax uh, to, to work with us um, and to educate each other. Um, and that, that's, that is a way that we can 
learn more and grow and and you know do this work and so uh leanne i really appreciate that you that you brought that up um and obviously the relationship has to be there um if you're going to ask someone to pay that cultural tax um and i think you know i think a lot of teachers are taking the time to understand and celebrate identities that are not their own uh, and to create safe spaces where students and other educators feel seen and heard and supported to add different voices to their curriculum um, I think that some educators are applying rules and policies in different ways for different students, depending on their needs, which I think is really good. And I think a lot of educators are willing to own their flaws and improve and, and keep growing into this work. Um, I think that some things that need improvement, like Kalisa and Leanne already mentioned, people are really confused about the difference between equity and equality. And also some folks think equity is political, that it's just like this liberal thing to do. Um, I don't know your experiences in other states, but I know in Minnesota and the sort of more affluent uh, suburbs or, or areas that they are sort of, uh, think of it as sort of like a bad liberal word. Um, and, 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 you know, and some people struggle with wanting to see as individuals as individuals and, and feel like rules and policies have to be for a group as a whole. And, and some folks think it's not fair to do something different for different people. Uh, but, you know, uniformity is not equity. And I think that's uh, important for folks to sort of consider. Um, in my experience, approaches to teaching educational equity seem to work better when it's centered in a growth mindset and isn't shame based. Um, and then, you know, some, some folks are not always cognizant of the way that different identities can intersect, like Kalisa was mentioning, um, and that that can create really unique experiences, which is why I really appreciate what Casey and Leanne both said, and I'm a huge supporter of utilizing an intersectional equity lens in everything that we do. So it sounds a lot to all of us that words matter, something that we know, terms matter. I mean, Casey even brings up the high performing, low performing. We think we're doing one thing, but we're saying another. We've heard equity, we've heard equality. This would be the, the final question just for all of you just to, to weigh in on as you close. If equity isn't the right word, what word would you choose to help us think about what we need to do to provide students with the type of education that they need? I know I said one word, it's probably two or three, but if you had to pick one, what's your word? I would say uh, social, I'm gonna give you three, social, emotional equity. Okay, so S-S-E, C. C, yeah. Okay, all right, Jonas. I'm gonna go with liberation. Okay, and we've heard that come up before. All right, so there's these, Two for liberation, one silent, one verbal on this one. Leanne. I like liberation, but I'm going to go with justice. Okay. Uh, we can become justice-minded educators, which is interesting because in classrooms all across this country, okay. kids stand up every day and pledge allegiance, uh, justice for all, but until now, the justice has been mainly for some. So it's moving from just us to justice. Okay. Uh, my word is abolition. Abolition. Seeing a theme, okay. I've got to go with Kalisa's word, liberation, because we are all, we are all chained in one way or another. And I think too, we need to think and remember that our, and I'm not the first person to say this, right, but that um, we are bound up together in this. Um, and so none of us are free until all of us are free. So let's liberate education. I love it. I hope so, please. I hope someone wrote down your phrase there because that was that was good. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep with equity, but I'm gonna throw intersectional in there. So to me, it's intersectional equity. I think everything sort of comes from that. I'm already biased because the title of my second edited book is Education for Liberation, and it's a book about uh, teaching inside US prisons. And so the liberation piece, because you don't have liberty without liberation. Um, you don't have libra or liberate, depends on where you're from, and life without it as well. Well, I wanna thank each one of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to have a conversation about equity in the classroom, walking away knowing that equity is how we walked in, but liberation, uh, abolition, uh, intersectionality, I think another one's for liberation and justice, how they all come into place. 
Because again, when we say we want justice, but when you look at the end, you keep fighting just us, then that's a problem. And one of the things that we do here at the Institute when we talk about uh, a character, uh, our founder, James Hunter, uh, has written a number of books. But what he says is that when you have social movements in any country across time, uh, it was through networks that people came together. And I take a passage from uh, a speech I once heard from uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell. And he talked about the uh, Italian Renaissance, or some would call it the, uh, the Renaissance in Florence. And he said, all of the geniuses who we now know today who find themselves coming out of the Italian Renaissance, he said they would get together and talk. And he said, they weren't geniuses because they got together. It's because they got together that they became geniuses. And it's through the gathering of the people and the conversations like this that we get to justice and to liberation and to intersectionality and to justice, liberation and abolition in different ways. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for listening to our program today. For In Character, I am Gerard Robinson.